Let the boy try along this bayonet blade. How cold steel is, and keen with hunger of blood. Blue with all malice, like a madman's flash, and thinly drawn with famishing for flesh. Lend him to stroke these blind, blunt bullet legs, which long to nuzzle in the hearts of lads. Or give him cartridges whose fine zinc teeth are sharp with sharpness of grief and death. For his teeth seem for laughing round an apple, There lurk no claws behind his fingers sup. And God will grow no talons at his heels, nor antlers through the thickness of his curls. I like that one. I like all of them, but that one's very beautiful, I think. Explain that get out of your own way thing. It's just to remind me that, um, you know, who I think I am gets in the way of who I am. You know, so get out of your own way is... It's just a constant reminder not to get carried away with ideas of myself and just to go back to basics. Um, there's a sort of expression in Zen Buddhism, which is beginner's mind. And I, I mean, I attempt to apply it um, to my own daily life, beginner's mind. In other words, you don't know bugger all um, work on that premise. Well, I first adhered to this philosophy, you know, you know, from the roots of it were in my very, very early childhood of, you know, complete disillusionment with the presented world. You know, I was born during the war, the last world war. My father was away at war, so I never met him until I was about three or four or something. And, you know, when he came, I didn't like him because I'd had a sort of nice relationship with my mother, which wasn't interfered by this man who suddenly came into my life. And he came into my, you know, up until then, as far as I, I, I can't remember it, of course, but I was comfortable. You know, I spent a lot of time under a kitchen table because it was safer from the bombs, but, you know, I mean, I was probably happy under the kitchen table and then I, or in the arms of my mother. And then dad turned up with tales of what he called the real world and tales of war, which he wasn't, he didn't actually tell many war tales. People were too busted or hurt or terrorized to ever be able to tell the real tales of war. But, you know, he was a very unhappy man, understandably. But I didn't understand that, understandably. You know, so from the start, I wasn't going to buy into his idea of the real world. And the, and the, and the crunch came when I took a book out of my uh, parents' library. <clears throat> it was a black-covered book, and it was pictures from Auschwitz. You know, it was a, a book about the death camps. And it just was like a storm you know, because I thought, that's the real world he's talking about. You know, all these bodies in a pit. And it terrorised me. You know, I thought, I, I can't live in that, I won't live in it. And actually, so that was the birth of how I think. I wasn't going to accept the world I was being handed because it was cruel, I could see that. I didn't need to look much further to see the cruelty. 
So I re reacted against that, you know, I reacted, you know, by not wanting to learn about it, you know, so I was a terrible failure at school. I mean, in my terms, I was a great success in school because I managed to get thrown out of two. Well, I think that's a very successful treatment of what they call education because I had contempt for that education. Few of us used to go to the local coffee bar, which was called the Flamenco. <laughs> At that time, I, I was really into blues, you know, sort of lead belly and people like that. And a mate of mine could play the guitar. And we used to go down there after school and sort of he'd play the guitar and we'd sing these blues songs. And, you know, lots of the girls from the girls' school used to come along and we used to drink frothy coffee and smoke cigarettes. And anyway, so the local paper decided, you know, that bohemianism from public school boys and girls wasn't acceptable. So I sort of grabbed and dragged off to the headmaster and got a thorough caning and then I was expelled. I wouldn't comply with anything. I didn't do anything at all. I didn't go to classes. I just hung out and went for walks and just didn't do anything. You know, slowly and gradually, that was, there was t within that, there was a sort of the formation of, you know, if you like, a philosophy. Oh, when I was about 14, the family went on holiday in Positano in Italy. I met up with this artist who used to sit on the uh, little alleyway down to the beach and with paintings that looked a bit like Monet's water lily paintings. He's selling them to the very wealthy tourists that inhabited Positano. And um, he gave me a book about Zen so, you know, and Zen made complete sort of sense. I mean, it was just like a spark of light in all the sort of madness. And um, certainly over the last six or seven years, I've been practicing, in other words, meditating every day, going on retreats, studying the scriptures, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, not that I regard myself as Zen, but it's the closest thing within the material world that makes any sort of sense to me. And it inspires me. And I mean, that, you know, something like get out your own way is archetypally Zen in what it's saying. Yeah. Um, and bit by bit, it introduced me to all the sort of outcrops of that. I mean, it, it sort of made me... Um, very receptive to, uh, for example, to the Beats, who I, you know, got to be reading when I was probably in my early twenties. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because they, you know, that was so heavily one of their influences. You know, Zen had a terrific influence, particularly on the West Coast in America. So it opened up doorways, you know, to a sort of huge range of stuff that otherwise I wouldn't have gotten hold of. This is Dial House. One of the outcomes of what I've been describing about my childhood um, was knowing that I didn't want to live like that. I tried, I became a professional. I, I went to art school and then after that, I started doing professional portraiture, uh, painting pictures of people. And then I got a teaching job you know, which I fell foul in my own head with very, very quickly. So I sort of partly resigned, but really I was pushed out. And I came back here. I was living with two other of the lecturers from the art school. And I said, look, I don't like this way of life. I want to take the locks off the door. I want everything to be shared. I don't, I'm not into this sort of having you with a cupboard with your food in it and me with a cupboard. In it. I didn't like that. I wanted, I'm going to open it up. It's only recently I've come to realise I was also trying to open up my heart. So it was a sort of like an open door, open heart policy. And then I just basically waited and let life happen. I was working on the farm, potato picking, because that's how I started making money, doing things like working on the farm or working at the coal yard during the winter. And Steve turned up, and he was a very, very pissed-off working-class kid who 
knew there was nothing for him out there, you know, being offered. He knew that this place was a haven. Our degrees of pissed offness, of unhappiness, found voice, you know, and it, found, and it, and it was quite a jubilant voice in sort of downright naughtiness. Um, and it was a real, well, piss off then. You know, and then very soon, you know, a third element it was Eve. She's the great unacknowledged force of Crass, if you like, because she had a very, very profound influence on both Steve and myself through her thinking, which was, you know, I would say pretty radical feminist. So it was that threesome initially, which was the sort of puckish naughtiness of Crass. That's the first time I saw Crass. My friend had the Yes Sir Where I Will poster on his wall. Right. Can you explain what, that, what it is? Yeah, well, it's a guy who had his, you know, face removed through shellings or through fire, I think, in the Falklands War. And <clears throat> there was a sort of gathering after the war, a sort of, do they call them celebrations, glorifications, whatever they call them. When Prince Charles came to Simon Weston, he said, uh, get well soon. And, and Weston's response was, yes, sir, I will. It says it all, doesn't it? I mean, it's a sort of pure piece of haiku. I mean, it's the greatest poem that was ever written. It wasn't that that inspired the writing of, um, which made up the sort of 45 minute rant that, yes, sir, I will was, but it certainly inspired the title and the, you know, it's repeated. That encounter with Prince Charles and Weston is, is repeated at the end of the piece. So that's you know anti-war statement. You know it was my war requiem, if you like. You know that's a pretty grand way of putting it, isn't it? You know, but it was the best I could do at the time to, you know, explain my sense of revulsion and disgust and despair about you know man's inhumanity to man which is very much an absolutely core feature of Wilfred Owen's poems. How are you attracted to Wilfred Owen? Um, ma mainly through um, the war requiem, Benjamin Britten's war requiem. Owen wasn't really very highly regarded uh, within the sort of canon of of, of uh, English poetry until Britain set his poems into the Requiem Mass, which was in the early 60s. And it, and it coincided with an increasing repulsion of war. You know, up until then, the great war poets were sort of generally the sort of slightly jingoistic. Owen's message was very much more passionate, very much more unjudgmental. I mean, I know that Owen became shell-shocked and came back to Britain and was in hospital. And he could easily have not returned. But he did return, you know, to his death. But he returned not because of he believed in the war. By that time, he didn't believe in the war. He believed in was his men. And that's a sort of very deep form of love, I think. And that's what I found performing his poems. I mean, it's fabulous that Derek, at, you know, One Little Indian, was interested enough to say, yeah, that's great, I, you know, I want you to do it, and I'll you know, I'll finance it and I'll find you a really, really good studio. This deserves a really good studio. It's nice when someone says something like that. How did you meet Derek Burkett and My Little Indian? Well, because I was, I produced their first single. He used to be in a band called Flux of Pink Indians. Bjork has got kind of what made My Little Indian big, right? Yeah. Yeah, I will do, yeah, yeah. Good. 
Right, so well, shall we go Great. from the start, which is you basically... Well, initially, having decided I wanted to perform Owen's poems, I um, looked to what musicians I felt would best accompany me. <laughs> Kate, the cellist. She's a sort of, I, I describe her as an avant-garde romanticist. So she manages to work within the avant-garde feel with, you know, incredible roman romantic fluidity, which I liked. Liam Noble, who's an extraordinary and very well-respected sort of frontline avant-gardist, he's totally unpredictable and an extraordinary interpreter. He doesn't take the obvious. Sing me at morn, but only with your laugh, even as spring that laugheth into leaf, even as love that laugheth after life. Sing me. But only with your speech all day, as voluble leaflets do. Let vials die, the least word of your lips is melody. I will not do anything unless it openly and overtly promotes the cause of peace and love. That's my only interest. I mean, that's my calling, if, for want of a better word, you know, well, Owen is one way of defining both peace and love. Sing me at eve, but only with your sigh. Like lifting seas is soliceth. Breathe so slowly and low, a sense that no songs say. With your murmurous heart, let youth's immortal moaning chords be heard throbbing through you and sobbing, unsubdued. You can't look to any authority but yourself, and neither can you be ruled by any authority but yourself. Even of those who acknowledge they say, oh, I can't exist properly because, you know, the police are such pigs or because the laws are so... Well, who's accepting the police or who's accepting the laws? You are, so it's your, your responsibility. It's not their responsibility, it's your responsibility. So there is no authority but yourself. And what that simply means is don't look to others and don't be cowed by others. Don't be fearful of others. That's their business, not yours. And it's only because... People don't simply look at life in that way to realise that they are the only authority. It's they are choosing to buy into or buy, not buy into it because they don't realise that, that people live fearful lives. You don't have to feel fear, it's just something, you know, you buy into. Would you see the fire from your sanctuary of death? What 